let me introduce you to our first keynote speaker, Mike Power. Uh, Mike is a professor of accounting and director of the Centre for the Analysis of Risk and Regulation at the London School of Economics. Um, he is very, very smart and knows everything there is to know about risk management. Uh, he works, also advises or works where my financial, uh, financial advisor uh, works, so I'm, I'm even more uh, happy uh, having heard that. And um, so what Mike is going to talk about is uh, really uh, the journey of business continuity into mainstream risk management. So please welcome Mike Power. Thanks very much, Steve, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you have a fantastic two days, uh, and this evening sounds a lot of fun as well. So um, I'm an academic at the London School of Economics, spend a lot of time thinking about risk management. I'm also on the board of uh, uh, St. James's Place, which is in the FTSE 100 uh, market, uh, and I chair the risk committee, and I'm on the audit committee. So uh, I'm kind of a user of business continuity management services. So I'm going to give you a kind of, uh, sort of bird's eye view of uh, what I think are some of the sort of major pressures to change in risk management uh, and some of their implications for BCM, acknowledging that, that you are the experts in BCM and I'm not. But I always think uh, a view from an ignorant outsider can shine a light uh, on certain areas. So what I'm going to talk about are some brief comments about the financial crisis, uh, the challenges uh, that that posed to risk management and some of the responses that are going on at the moment, uh, the impact of what I call regulatory culture, which I'll explain in more detail shortly, and the idea I've developed uh, and seen in practice is that there are there are kind of two risk managements. Uh, the management that you, you have to um, present to outsiders uh, and the real risk management. And they're not always connected, and I'll say a little bit about that. And then develop the uh, presentation by drawing out some implications and challenges for BCM within risk management. And touch on uh, the theme of risk culture and how BCM uh, is a very important part of this uh, new thing in uh, financial services that everyone is interested in called risk culture. Uh, and I'd just like to apologise in advance because my perspective is going to be very much from a, a corporate point of view and probably from a sort of financial services point of view, but I, I hope uh, some of the insights uh, and comments will travel into, into your worlds if, if they're very different from that. So what were the, crisis, uh, the, cha the challenges of the, uh, the financial crisis? Uh, I think one of the major challenges for risk management is that uh, we were engaged in illusions of control, as some commentators call it, that there was lots and lots of stuff going on in risk management, a huge industry indeed, uh, and yet somehow it didn't, be a, didn't seem to be effective when it was really needed. Uh, Enterprise risk management risk maps seem to mesmerize uh, uh, boards of directors into thinking that things were in control. Uh, model assumptions around uh, market risk and credit risk models were taken for granted, not challenged, uh, and people didn't even know there were any assumptions, that they were just simply descriptors of reality. Uh, and a very important dimension of uh, risk, at least in the financial sector, uh, liquidity risk was uh, rather underplayed relative to technical definitions of solvency. Uh, and what we essentially had in the financial crisis was a kind of bank run. It wasn't a conventional bank run. It was uh, a bank run in the, in the wholesale markets where banks lend to each other. Uh, and a sudden, uh, a very small losses in the subprime market in the United States. You know, not very significant in absolute terms, but that triggered a loss of confidence uh, in wholesale financing, and that just created uh, a flight to quality, uh, a bank run. Institutions found that they couldn't uh, refinance themselves uh, very quickly. 
and suddenly you're into a fire sale of assets and uh, the rest is, is kind of history. So what was the real kind of problems with uh, risk management at that time? Well, uh, it's been much written about and there are lots of different views and case, case studies. Uh, one of m the things I latch on to is the sort of information fragmentation in, in risk management. Uh, some financial institutions, uh, they didn't even have an aggregate view of their financial position in certain instruments because different bits of the organization uh, were trading um, credit derivatives, for example. So uh, just basic adding up the number of positions uh, you had um, seemed to have failed. Uh, and I think that reflected um, a sort of deeper cultural issue that control functions in this, at this time, whether it's internal audit, risk management, proper compliance, etc., uh, had very low status in some of these organizations and were very much playing catch up. So I think there's an important diagnosis is there was a sort of a, a risk culture failure. Uh, and I would imagine that um, you know, business continuity management was, was at least in those financial institutions, uh, a very poor relation of the, the front office. So it wasn't just banks themselves. Regulators had their um, eye off the ball. Uh, they were very micro-focused on the prudential strength of individual entities rather than the financial system as a whole and, and, and its interconnectedness. So as I've already said, small losses in the subprime triggered this, this bank run and uh, revealed to the world just how interconnected uh, major financial institutions were. And enterprise risk management, risk management at the enterprise level, uh, we all know now, but um, it wasn't apparent uh, back in 2005, where you thought if, as long as you get entity-based risk management correct, then the system will take care of itself. Well, we don't think that anymore. And Enterprise risk management, or at least certain variants of it, are not very good on entity interconnectedness, on, on looking through uh, counter financial counterparties uh, and even infrastructure connectedness as well. Uh, and I think one of the advantages of the sort of BCM, uh, for all its diversity, is that it is in principle very open to uh, the idea of connectedness. That's a sort of uh, a fundamental. Uh, principle of looking beyond the boundaries of the enterprise and, and thinking about the position of the enterprise in its uh, um, local environment and in its infrastructure environment as well. So I think these are the kind of, this is the sort of diagnosis uh, and some of the challenges of the financial crisis. If we move on to the responses, then <clears throat> it's very clear that there have been uh, enormous efforts by regulators, institutions, states, uh, and a number of change programs. So uh, at St. James's Place, where I'm on the board, liquidity risk is now a big focus. Uh, and there have been a number of, uh, I think, interesting kind of structural responses as well. Uh, I always thought risk management functions were quite centralized in organizations, but this was not so, but certainly since 2008-9, uh, much more of a consolidation of risk capability into central uh, functions with uh, far more organizational authority. Uh, and some of you will have heard, uh, no doubt, of the phrase three lines of defense, uh, which came into existence uh, around about the same time, uh, a way of uh, structuring uh, risk management between the actual the doing of risk management inside the doing of the business, uh, separate from oversight capabilities, which would advise uh, and provide critical oversight of the function, and a third line in terms of an assurance function. Uh, that's become something uh, of a, a kind of orthodoxy now, and even a cliche, the three lines of defense. Um, what I see in practice as I, as I do research in this area is that um, all the real risk management action is in the fuzzy space between the second and the first line, uh, and uh, th this distinction is always not always so easy to uh, um, operationalize at the organizational level. But nevertheless, there is a, a kind of presumption that of this kind of structure is the way risk management should look. Within the regulator, there's been um, <coughs> uh, they've upped their game on in terms of. Uh, having a, a new and refreshed emphasis on the prudential strength of financial institutions. 
Those of you who work in the UK will know that we've now got two regulators uh, instead of one. Uh, one focused on prudential matters, the other focused on financial conduct issues. Uh, and at the heart of the kind of prudential toolbox is a, a new priority being given to um, reverse stress testing, which I think um, is probably uh, a kind of BCM concept uh, in, in a different language, something that you'll recognize. What's involved there is uh, requiring organizations to take seriously the circumstances under which they would fail completely. What are the scenarios under which business models would break? Uh, and these can range from, you know, classic scenarios like a fall in the, in the stock market by 40 or 50 percent to pandemics to other kinds of uh, major supplier failures and things like that. Um, and it's interesting, uh, you know, reverse stress testing or stress testing of a business model uh, has many ter technical parameters, but what's important is that the senior management of the organization really buy into this psychologically. That is to say that they really think uh, and take seriously the idea that the world could be very different from the one they live in. And I think that's probably something that is very close to the um, operational philosophy of, of, of many of you. Uh, but I've observed that actually chief executive officers and senior executives who necessarily, uh, for good reasons, tend to have an optimi optimism bias, find it very difficult to confront uh, stress test scenarios. So there is a sort of behavior, some behavioral barriers around stress testing, even though, uh, w which are irrespective of their um, sort of technical qualities. As I've always been mentioned, there's now a very um, strong accent on, on risk culture, but the, the notion of risk culture raises uh, as many questions, uh, or even more questions than its answers. I guess I kind of view risk culture as a symptom term, uh, that it's symptomatic of the fact that uh, our belief in a lot of the technical parameters of risk management has been shaken somewhat, uh, and we realize that uh, human behavior is obviously an important part of this, uh, and the term risk culture is saying we need to spend time thinking about those things. Uh, now, my colleagues and I at the LSE have done a little bit of research going around banks and insurers, um, asking them what they think risk culture is, and then sifting through the results. Uh, and I mean, it's a long and complex report, as you'd expect from a bunch of academics, but there are a few kind of key messages. Uh, and the sort of headline one is really, it, it's a lot of it's about the authority of the risk function uh, broadly conceived, not just risk management, but the authority of control functions inside uh, financial organizations. Uh, and that's a function of uh, leadership attitudes, etc. Equally, I think um, uh, an important issue is the sort of attitude to what are called, what we might call trading limits or, or sort of the boundaries of, of business and business decision making where we saw in the crisis that these were often worked around or breached or there are lots of special cases. Uh, this is called risk appetite in, in another language, but uh, uh, it's the same kind of thing. You know, if you don't take the limits of your uh, business practices seriously as limits so that when they're breached in some sense or when you get close to them, there's a kind of conversation or a process for dealing with that. If you don't take that seriously, then you don't really have uh, risk management as such. And I think that's that sort of core risk culture. Uh, and interestingly, I've come across the phrase respect for control. Respect for control as being essential uh, to risk culture. In, in other words, prior to the financial crisis, it was clear that control functions weren't respected. Uh, I'll just throw a question out to you. you know, do you feel in your organizations that BCM has the respect of senior management uh, and frontline operational, uh, operational units uh, that it should have. Uh, so very soft issues. These are not the issues we're traditionally used to dealing with, but these are, these are cultural issues. And of course, there's been a, a huge amount of uh, attention given by the regulator, the press, etc., to incentives, to levels of remuneration, uh, and while I admit that's important, uh, and um, I'm at the front line of some of that discussion myself, uh, I don't think it's the most, most important thing. I think it's something that's been uh, 
rather um, over-politicised, but that's a, a personal view. So on to the impact of regulatory culture. <clears throat> Those of you who work in regulated organisations, which is practically all of us, I mean, I'm continually amazed at how regulated uh, universities are these days. Um, good, you might say, uh, having been unregulated for a long time, but there is uh, uh, increasing regulation of um, uh, the classroom. Uh, I now have to monitor students' whereabouts uh, in ways that we didn't have to do 10 years ago um, for security reasons. So there's, uh, in all businesses, and particularly in financial services, uh, a whole plethora of regulations coming from lots of different sources, uh, European Union, the uh, United States has um, some interesting sort of extra, extra territorial reach in some of its regulations on, uh, on sanctions and so on. And of course the, the Basel Committee now um, revisiting its, uh, its failed regulation on bank capital adequacy. Uh, and in all of this, uh, it's clear that regulators need robust evidence of uh, the processes going on inside organizations, whatever they are, and they particularly in the financial sector need evidence of uh, risk management processes. Uh, there was a very interesting fine dished out to AXA um, just a few months ago by the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, essentially AXA hadn't done anything wrong in a substantive sense as far as I can see. Uh, there was no client detriment uh, as far as anyone could see. Uh, but they, they just hadn't properly addressed the evidencing of their processes. Uh, and this regulator has made it clear that it's going to act preemptively in such cases uh, because uh, of the risk that that um, poor evidencing uh, of process uh, poses. Uh, that's a very different world from the one we used to live in uh, 10 years ago where you can really be taken to the cleaners for uh, not having appropriate uh, documentation. Uh, and in the face of this uh, uncertainty, uh, regulatory uncertainty, uh, we see eviden uh, evidence that organizations are sort of gold plating, reacting by gold plating or amplifying the, uh, the evidentiary requirements of the regulator, just to be sure. Uh, and that doesn't sound a sort of bad thing in itself, uh, but it does tend to um, suck in talent, which could be better deployed uh, elsewhere. So uh, we note in our study a kind of increase in headcount in compliance and compliance type departments uh, over, the, over the period uh, as uh, getting the documentation right for submission to the regulator is a kind of organisational priority. Uh, and this is a strange situation where, in a sense, the regulator becomes the client of the organization. Um, and I think, uh, I, I don't really know where that process is going to end, but it has, uh, I can understand why we are where we are in, in those terms, but um, it, it doesn't mean, seem to me to be a sustainable um, position for business. Um, <clears throat> and of course, as part of this, uh, we kind of, we have more and more zero tolerance or quasi zero tolerance areas in inside businesses where what I mean by that is it's not particularly risk based where failure can't be tolerated because of the concerns of the regulator. So areas, technical areas like client money and, and anti money laundering regulations where, um, where it's actually quite difficult to get things absolutely right. Uh, this creates a lot of uh, nervousness of organizations because there's a perception of zero tolerance. So we've also uh, sort of lost the narrative of being risk-based in a number of areas of risk management. And being risk-based means actually you do your best, but, I, but there is a chance of failure. Uh, and things going wrong is not always a sign that you got your risk management wrong. It's just within uh, normal expectations over a period. Uh, it seems to me that conception of being risk-based in one's approach to activities has kind of been squeezed out. Uh, so I think that's, that's a real worry. And, and coupled to that is the, if you like, the bureaucratization. I've touched on it before with the ACSA fine, the bureaucratization of risk management, 
in which uh, demonstrable process, uh, endless PowerPoint slides like this one being presented to boards of directors, uh, goes on and on. And this has a, a what I would call a crowding effect uh, on um, more thoughtful approaches to, to risk management. And I wanted to sort of characterize that crowding effect by talking of the sort of two risk managements, which I mentioned at the, uh, the beginning of uh, uh, the talk. Uh, and this is all a bit of a, a kind of parody, if you like, but I, I, it does have some important messages. So I distinguish between what I call the formal and the clean risk management uh, and the informal and the messy risk management. So the clean risk management uh, is defined by um, <coughs> enterprise risk management templates uh, and the giving of an appearance of control via risk maps. Uh, I, as a chair of a risk committee, uh, I look at endless Excel spreadsheets uh, with various colors on them. Uh, we all do that. That's become a bit of an industry. Uh, I hope, like you, I find those sometimes rather mesmerizing uh, uh, and not, not very useful. Uh, they're, they're certainly good as a kind of window into a conversation, um, but as an end in themselves, they're very imperfect. And as we all know, um, they don't show risk connectivity at all. You have to hunt for that in, uh, in a spreadsheet. And maybe there's some WISO kind of spreadsheets out there in the hall that uh, give you that kind of connectedness. Um, the dominant focus of this uh, clean risk management is, is controls, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm being a bit unfair here, but the, uh, at the center of it all lies the sort of internal order to action points. If you can clear the action points, well, we're fine, aren't we? Uh, and uncleared action points, or the non-executive directors sort of say, this is terrible, you know, we should clear our action points. Really, I mean, it is a kind of discipline, but it seems to get uh, disproportionate attention in organizations. And all of this is really designed for a nice safe world with a few wrinkles in it. It's designed for business as usual. Uh, it's highly institutionalized. Uh, lots of professionals work in this space. There are lots and lots of best practice standards which compete with each other. Uh, but there is a, a sort of underlying uh, compliance mentality which informs them, or, or at least is in danger of informing them. I contrast this with the kind of informal, messy stuff uh, which focuses on um, risk interconnection, causal, surprising causal links between uh, different bits of businesses, what um, some of my academic colleagues call overflows uh, of risk that can't easily be contained in a particular cell on a particular spreadsheet. Uh, and this requires an organization, uh, some of its participants, particularly uh, the, the more senior executives, to be culturally able to imagine, uh, sustain the imagine, imagination of a non-normal world, the, to imagine the world as being different. And this reaches back to the point I was making about um, stress testing, not just being a kind of technical thing you do with a, a tweaking a few variables, but it's how you stage that stress test in the organization, who's there, who, who buys into the process of thinking about a rather unpleasant future for the organization. Uh, and it's interesting, compared to the clean risk management, is that these processes have what I consider to be very low institutionalization. They happen in kind of very ad hoc ways, often driven by um, enthusiasts inside organizations. I'm sure many of you are those enthusiasts. So <clears throat> stress testing, um, not just financial stress testing, but the development of scenarios uh, and the posing of what if type questions uh, are, are very important in, in this, this messy world. They're not easy to contain. They require people to um, sort of engage with that process. And again, the question I throw out to you to think about is um, uh, in your practice of BCM, uh, where do you see yourself? You know, are you a mix of the two? How do you position uh, BCM as a, as a hybrid of uh, both of these components? I would say, I mean, both are important, uh, but we seem to uh, have got the balance wrong uh, in, in recent years. So what about um, 
yourselves in these two days and uh, some of the, the sort of challenges for uh, BCM, uh, as I understand it, within risk management. <clears throat> and here I might be um, a little controversial for, for such an audience, but I would say that if history was somewhat different, um, BCM, we wouldn't be having this conversation. BCM would be the starting point for thinking about risk management. And that, in a sense, is uh, uh, the journey that Steve alluded to uh, when he introduced me. Um, as I read it, uh, and again, mine is a bird's eye view, so I don't want to offend, but historically, I think BCM has been organizationally a poor relation, disempowered, uh, in what I would call the non-high reliability operational context. So organizations which absolutely have some notion of reliability, high reliability at their center, safety, et cetera, um, airlines, for example, uh, would definitely have a, a lot of attention on BCM. But in a lot of other organizations, it's sort of been marginalized for, from the main currents of risk management outside of considerations of the business model, outside of debates about business strategy. Uh, and part of my talk is to say, what do you want to do about that? And what are the explanations for that? If that's correct, uh, and just, just bear with me for a second, if that's correct, what's the explanations for that? Well, I think one of the possible explanations is really the sort of dominance of risk management by portfolio theory and finance. I mean, that's kind of where financial risk management started. Uh, and that has kind of sucked in all the, a, a lot of intellectual capital. Um, the London School of Economics, where I work, we teach the kids about value at risk models and portfolio analysis and all that sort of thing. So we're part of that system reproducing that conception of, of risk management, not in my courses, I might add, but some of my colleagues. Uh, and operational risk, as you all know, was much slower to emerge and, and to consolidate itself from lots of different elements from the mid-1990s onwards. So relative to financial economics as the center of gravity for financial risk management, BCM looks a lot less gra glamorous, has less of a seat at the table. Uh, BCM also strikes me, notwithstanding the, the great work of the, uh, the, the BCI, is to have relatively weak institutionalization relative to uh, some of these other currents in, in risk management. What, are the, what might be the reasons for that? Well, in a way, the territory of BCM cuts across a number of other sort of professional stakeholders, if you like. So accountants and auditors think they know about going concern, and going concern is a kind of BCM sort of issue. Uh, st strategy specialists uh, think they know about sustainable business models. Well, the sustainability of a business model, subject to shocks, is a kind of BCM issue. And stress testing, as I've already mentioned, at the heart of capital management and insurance uh, have their own sort of pockets of expertise, but in a way they are business continuity management issues. So. I think there is a sort of positioning of BCM in the risk management fabric, which is not, is not static. I mean, it's changing all the time and, and becoming more central, particularly now, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, that is, uh, is sort of a big issue for the field. And I think uh, one of the points I put down here is um, sort of a clash of entities. I think what's so interesting to the extent I know enough about it, about BCM as a discipline compared to these other things, is that they tended to be entity-based, whereas BCM specialists have a much more porous view of the organization, or think uh, automatically about supply chains, or think about uh, localities uh, and um, businesses in the environment, uh, as we, we found out in the sort of Bunsfield explosion in this country um, uh, several years ago. So I think, uh, hopefully I'm not being too romantic, uh, uh, BCM specialists uh, are, have a, a broader view of the organizational space than, uh, than many of these others. So that, I think, is a, a source of opportunity. So carrying on with uh, that kind of analysis, um, I think for BCM, and I, and I speak more now as a, a sort of non-executive director who's sort of interacted with sort of BCM functions. 
Uh, I think the organisational credibility of BCM is very varied uh, and very dependent upon the sort of qualities of uh, the people in that area to uh, engage with the business. Uh, and whether and how it's perceived as business central is likely to be contingent on the specific uh, um, industrial sector in which, uh, in which it's involved. So I've mentioned airlines uh, before, um, railways and so on, they're likely to have um, a high, high degree of focus here. There are also a number of perceptions and biases which may be incredibly unfair, but they're out there uh, and um, one has to deal with that. Uh, I always remember talking to executives who keep telling you, oh, we're undervalued, the market doesn't understand us. Uh, well, actually, maybe the market is telling you something that you have to listen to, even if you think it's unfair. So I think some of these perceptions are out there. Um, there is, uh, rightly or wrongly, a perceived operational and technology focus. Uh, uh, and that perception exists in part because the sort of the makeup of most boards of most large companies, at least in the United Kingdom, perhaps not Germany, um, tends to be full of accounting and strategy type people. Uh, it'd be a very interesting question to know how many technology people really are on the boards of uh, at least non-technology companies. Um, so there is that, uh, I would say, from my point of view, um, a certain kind of lack of confidence at the executive level in engaging with uh, specialist technology functions which would have a, a BCM component uh, attached to them. Uh, I think the onset of the cloud, from my point of view, has sort of has changed that and people are realizing that now has to be a strategic discussion about technology in the business. Um, that's happened already in many organizations, but it, it, it's a kind of journey of expertise, both for boards of directors and for technology and BCM people to find a common language. Uh, it's also, you know, and I've heard this uh, in my experience, being regarded as a sort of necessary evil, an expense without any um, immediate value. Um, a perceived value only to those organizations that had very, very specific historical experiences. So I think like all um, risk management control functions, the, the articulation of value is a, is a real challenge. And I'll, I'll close with a few comments about that. Uh, and I suppose the other worry is that, um, again, being rather simple-minded, I, I think BCM is about paying lots of attention to low probability, high impact events. Uh, and preparing for those. Um, one of the struggles with low probability, high impact events is to create meaningful actions for uh, the business out of them uh, 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 and getting commitment to plans and contingency plans and, and things like that. So I think actionability uh, uh, is always a challenge when there are many other more um, readily actionable uh, issues for executives to deal with. So that might be terribly unfair. There are kind of a collection of, um, of perceptions uh, uh, from, as I say, a, an ignorant outsider. But I think you probably have to face that ignorance as, as a reality in the world. Um, so what about the challenges for BCM within risk management? Well, on a more positive note, I think uh, I mean, some of these will be teaching you to suck eggs, but I think they're, they're just worth saying anyway. Um, uh, and it's advice I would I give to internal auditors and, and other control specialists. So there's a need for kind of really internal charismatic leadership of the BCM function uh, to increase its organizational footprint uh, and to um, be something like they have the stature of the kind of director of safety in airlines. Now, some of you will have achieved that and you'll have great relationships with uh, you know, CEOs and so on, uh, but it's very patchy. Uh, uh, and I think um, you don't want to be the person that's sort of brought out from time to time uh, when things go wrong. Um, the good thing is I think, uh, and it depends where you work, I know, so this is a sort of bias towards corporates. Uh, Non-executive directors like me are incredibly interested in BCM at the moment, and we're also incredibly ignorant. So I think there's a sort of fantastic opportunity uh, for uh, conversations, uh, 
informal conversations and to make those links and develop uh, relationships with non-executive directors for whom organisational resilience they now realise is, is part of what they have to think about. So finding ways to talk to those people, creating um, a sort of language which uh, can mediate between your specialist world and their concerns, I think is, is a great opportunity space for, for BCM. And I know there are some, some sessions later on in the conference which, which deal with that. So um, make it your job to have, uh, uh, to, to have some kind of indirect representation on audit committee, go to audit committee and talk about business continuity issues, go to risk committee. Uh, in many organizations, they'll be one and the same. Um, the other thing is um, who actually in the organizations you're involved with, who owns the uh, sort of stress testing scenario, thinking of alternative futures process? Um, that should be you. Uh, you should see that as your job is to present those alternative realities and action plans to, uh, to management. And here's the difficult one, uh, and uh, the, I, what I'm going to say is a sort of slightly glib. It's easy to say, harder to do. But I think, um, I think organizations are constituted by stories and narrative. Yeah, there's lots of kind of technological stuff, but, um, you know, Steve got you all to kind of talk to each other just for a, for a minute. And um, I could tell even that is a sort of very energizing uh, little thing that, that happens at conferences, and it, it's a great technique. Well, that's kind of what work needs to be like. I think uh, uh, BCM, risk management, internal audit, need to generate stories of their value, cases, vignettes, which can travel around the organization. Uh, I noticed at um, EasyJet, where I was a visitor, they, they actually had sort of safety stories circulating around the organization, private safety stories. Uh, and this helps to inculcate a discourse where resilience is a kind of normal way of talking about the business. If you can get people talking in a certain way, then um, a lot of other things follow. It's what my kind of uh, more philosophical colleagues call the performative nature of language. You know, start talking in a certain way and uh, uh, other things will follow. So create the discourse. Uh, yes, be technically excellent, but create the discourse. And that will involve some kind of translation in order to talk to uh, very ignorant directors like myself. Uh, and I guess the question I pose to you is, is there a kind of internal expectations gap uh, about the BCM function in the, in the organization that you need to address uh, and explain? Um, is BCM in your organization uh, fully risk-based itself uh, in its approach? Uh, or are you expected to just simply be the people who make sure everything runs on smoothly and, and never fails? You know, what is the attitude of the organization to uh, um, system failures and uh, recovery times and, uh, and things like that? Be part of the risk appetite conversation. So, um, you know, I'm involved in an organization where there's a sort of 72-hour uh, recovery period for, for systems loss. That's the target, so 72 hours. It seems a really long time to me, um, three days. Uh, but that's a risk appetite choice uh, and have the risk appetite discussion and then say, actually, look, can we bring that down a bit? Our appetite is for a lower threshold. Uh, and it seems to me that um, business continuity needs to be right in there with the kind of risk tolerance, risk appetite uh, discussion. Some of you will do that already, but it seems to me that it, it, it's a journey. Uh, and of course, you have to win the chief risk officer. You have to be very, very close uh, to that person, their, their right-hand person, uh, and help them do their job. Just finishing off on a, on a couple of slides. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I found so interesting doing the risk culture work, there was one organization, uh, and there was one guy uh, he was a guy, uh, not very senior in the risk team, but he was working his socks off to build networks around the organization, uh, a very large organization, with key, different key um, sort of functionalities, uh, particularly uh, human resources. So HR and risk management not really had much to do with each other over the years, and he was kind of creating this internal college 
of risk management allies. Uh, and I thought that was, uh, that was incredibly interesting that actually there was a sort of invisible organization within the organization to ensure the kind of what I call the trans-organizational representation of the risk management function. And that was, that was what he thought doing risk culture was. And it seems to me that sort of business continuity management, you know, you, you have a choice um, rather like academics. You know, you can sit in your office and do stuff or you can build these organizational networks to be effective. And those of you who do that already, I mean, the question is, you know, is it enough? You know, are you doing enough? Uh, and part of that role has to be educational within the organization. So, um, you know, do you see it as your job to actually build the capability of the organization to think sensibly about resilience issues? Or is that just your job? Is resilience your job or is it the the sort of education uh, of the rest of the business. Uh, and I think if you do kind of see it as your job to kind of disseminate, I, I think it's a tough one because I think really it's in the space of slow organic change rather than uh, any kind of short-term quick fix. But one of my favorites, uh, and, I, and I sort of, this is a function of you know, my own personal experience, is that it's important to ensure that drills and scenarios and emergency plans and exercises, et cetera, increase your credibility. They don't decrease them. Or you don't have people saying, well, what was the point of that type of thing? Why did we do that? Uh, and these are very, very kind of real challenges about getting the right kind and level of engagement between BCM and, and, and the rest of the business. So I'm just going to finish last slide. Um, in the risk culture work, one of the kind of interesting results we, we had again and again is that uh, really the position of BCM in relation to risk management was for us quite a strong lead indicator of the quality of the risk culture in the organization as a whole. Um, that is to say, the quality of the risk culture was a function of the ability of senior people uh, to think of alternative futures and build action plans around them. So that wasn't just a peripheral part of risk culture, it was absolutely culturally central. And we saw enormous variety, uh, enormous variety in, in the position of BCM in that sense. And in a very specific sense, we also saw enormous variety in the organizational care and attention that was paid to BCM policies and plans. So when we asked people, you know, how do updates and reviews of BCM plans happen in your organization? Um, you know, it was a mixed response from, you know, hysterical laughing, uh, nervous hysterical laughing to, uh, yeah, we look at that uh, on a monthly basis. So, um, you know, that seemed to me a kind of a really strong proxy for, uh, for risk culture. So I think in terms of this uh, journey to mainstreaming, um, I hope I've given you a kind of few little pointers and ideas, and I apologize if some of them were unduly um, patronizing, but the risk management space is there to be reorganized at the moment. We've gone through a huge trauma, uh, and uh, it's a kind of level playing field again, and I think uh, you know, BCM specialists have um, uh, a great opportunity. There's a, a new openness to sort of diverse skill sets, uh, which are not, you know, as a professor of accounting, which are not accounting based. Uh, it always amazes me how strong the kind of stranglehold of accounting is on a lot of and finance on risk management think thinking. Uh, and I think there's also um, just a huge, a very don't forget, there's a very strong societal interest in this theme of resilience at the moment. Uh, the resilience of, of individuals and organizations, uh, particularly with the kind of increased uh, frequency of, of cybercrime, the resilience of our cities, uh, and, and the resilience of the United Kingdom as such. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, this interest is born of a kind of wider uh, series of social anxieties which, uh, which undoubtedly exist, uh, and which I think business continuity management, the BCI, uh, your field, uh, you're uniquely positioned to um, uh, address that social role. So thank you very much. <laughs>